Hello, everyone. Um, a very warm welcome to the Scottish Wildlife Trust's AGM. We're starting bang on time. There's a few people who we are expecting, but we can just let them come in as they arrive. Um, I should say it's very warm in the room. So if anyone feels a bit hot and needs a drink or needs to be somewhere cooler, do feel free just to get up and, and go outside where they're on the table, there are the drinks and there's water there. Um, we don't want anyone getting heat stroke in, in this room today. We do have a fan on at the front, but um, that's as much as we can do by way of temperature. So do look after yourselves and, and do take a break out if you're feeling a bit hot. So a really big thank you to all of you for joining us today. I know chatting to people, people have come up at very early hours in the morning to be here, have taken long bus journeys, long journeys, um, and it is a huge testament to the commitment of the members of the Scottish Wildlife Trust that you make the journey and come and join us in different parts of Scotland for our AGM. And I think it's a really important um, symbol of the sort of values of the Trust. And thank you so much to all of you for making the commitment and being here today. AGMs aren't everyone's cup of tea but they're really really important so a huge thank you because the trust could not exist without the support of members being prepared to come and be part of events like this today for me is one of mixed emotions because this is my last agm as chair and um it's a role which i have enjoyed hugely over the last six years and i'll be very so sorry I'm handing the baton on to um, a very safe pair of hands, a very, um, a, a very excellent new chair who's coming in. I'll introduce you to later, but it is a, it is a sad time for me. Um, I have, I, I became a, I've, I took on this role having retired as a senior civil servant. And uh, it was the very first such role I took on and I waited quite a while after retirement before taking on anything new as people always advise you um, and this was closest to my heart and this is where I wanted to be. Um, since then I've taken on chair of a number, a couple of other organisations, a couple of charities um, and you've trained me well so they are, <laughs> are now looking for someone like me. What I can say is that in none of those organisations is that they dedication and commitment from the members that I've experienced in my time as chair and how much I've enjoyed meeting many of you, not just here, but many of you I've met in other places. And um, I have really, really valued that support. It's, me it's meant a huge amount, and particularly through the pandemic years, which were very difficult for all organisations. And knowing we had that security of the support of the members was so important. So thank you, thank you all. So before we actually turn to the formal agenda, I'd like to quickly ask Ruchia Cha, our Director of External Affairs, to run through a few housekeeping matters and outline the different ways that you can interact with the meeting. Um, this is an unusual event for us because it's our first ever attempt to hold a hybrid AGM. So we have people online, as many as we have in the room, and it's a really um, good opportunity for us to engage with our membership across Scotland, a, a totally new way of working. It's why we're going to have to stay fossilized and pinned to these microphones, which is not to my normal, I'm, I'm itching to move, but um, <laughs> I've got to stay here. So I'm now going to pass over to Rachia and he's going to talk about how we're going to um, operate today. Thank you, Linda, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, most importantly, I, I just want to just reflect what Linda said, that this is a hybrid event. So we have got yourselves uh, here in the room, but we also do have a well over, over 25 people in the online room as well, joining virtually. Um, for that reason as well, the session is being recorded, just so you're aware. Um, there's a few housekeeping things I'll just quickly run through. Firstly, just so you, you are aware, the toilets are on the floor above, or there's just, just through that one flight of steps and then on the level above, and it's towards the back on the right, the, the exhibits. And there's also toilets downstairs next to the cafe. Um, and uh, secondly, in terms of fire safety, just be aware that this is the main exit here on the side here. 
Um, but there is also, of course, fire exits to the right of the screen um, across from the desk on the outside as well, in case you need. There are no fire alarms scheduled for today. Um, it, apologies, but the lift is broken. Uh, we have communicated this in advance of the, the session, so hopefully you are already aware of that, but apologies for that. Um, also know that staff who, if you need any help with anything, staff are here with their names, uh, they've got titles on their name badges, so just feel free to, to nobble a, a member of staff if you need anything while you're here. Um, for the, those people that are joining online, the Zoom audience, uh, again, the event is being recorded, but please do use the chat if um, to you know if you want to make a comment or pass a message, uh, but don't uh, post or click on any links, any web links. Uh, please do use the Q and A panel, which you'll find there on your tab in, in Zoom um, for any questions and any uh, related upvoting of questions that you you would you would like to highlight. There is also interestingly now a new live caption service. Um, so if you are finding it a little bit difficult to hear some of the speakers, or if you are finding hard of hearing for uh, any of the session, then you can use that and it will, it will do a live caption for you in the Zoom window. You'll find that under, next to the more settings on your window. Um, also, just to mention that Liz from the Trust's Aberdeen Local Group will be taking a few snaps um, in the room in addition to the recording. So if you do have any questions, uh, about that, then please do go and catch Liz when you can. Liz, can you put your hand up so we know where you are, yeah? Thank you. Great, back to you, Linda. So thank you, um, and hello, everybody. Um, so let's turn to the programme for today. Um, in the first part, we are going to have the formal business of the annual general meeting. And then we'll have a presentation online by Joe Pike, our Chief Executive Officer, looking to the future. And then there's an opportunity to ask questions of the senior management team who will come up to the table at the front here. Then after a short break, we're going to have a presentation from the wonderful Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire local group who are our hosts here. And thank you very, very much for um, facilitating us today. And then we'll have some clips from a new film that the Wildlife Trust has produced called the Oceans of Value Project. So an exciting and full programme with, with lots of visuals. So I'm now going to turn to the formal part of the meeting for the AGM. I'd like to welcome you formally to the 59th annual general meeting of the Scottish Wildlife Trust. You will note that we are almost 60 years old. Um, which is a, a huge achievement. And I'm sorry that I'm not going to be chair for the 60th, but um, I'd like you to welcome you to the 59th. Um, the purpose of the AGM is to give you, the members, the opportunity to scrutinize the business of the trust, to influence our governance, and of course, to ask any questions you have relating to the running of the charity. I should note that we've received several apologies and those have all been noted. We then turn to the minutes. Um, the minutes were of the meeting would be held last year online on the 10th of September. The draft minutes have been on the website for some time. Um, I should point out there was a small error in what was originally posted, which was then corrected. So I formally ask the question, does anyone want to put forward any corrections to the minutes? I'm looking at no sea of hands here. What about online? No. So could I have a proposer that we accept the minutes as a true record? And you can either, if you're in the room, put your hand up, or you can use the chat box if you're online. And there's always an awkward silence at this point. Anthony. <laughs> Thank you. And what about a seconder? Hayley, thank you. So um, that means that we have now confirmed the minutes. Um, the senior management team have suggested that there are no matters arising as a result of the minutes, so we can now move on from the minutes. 
So we now formally receive the Council's report and accounts for the year ended the 31st of March 2023. I've had a busy year as chair, as normal, really enjoyed being out and about and meeting people and seeing our reserves. I would like to record my thanks to Joe Pike and to the staff team. They have done a tremendous job over the last year as we continue to recover from the pandemic and have been extremely dedicated in their work for the Trust. And I would like to put that on the record at this point. In my role as chair, I have oversight of council and its committees. And I'd like to give a really big thank you to all our trustees. Um, we have an excellent group of trustees. It's a much more diverse group than when I came in as chair. A huge wealth of talent around the board. We've got people who are very experienced in all sorts of governance matters. We have people who know a lot about conservation. And we've all sorts of, of practical skills around the table. Um, and I am hugely appreciative of all the work that the trustees have put in over the last year to support the trust. It has been absolutely excellent. We have three trustees in the room, so I'm going to embarrass them by asking them to stand up so you all know who they are. So we have Haley here in the green stripy jumper, we have Jen and we have Anthony, and you can make a beeline for them over lunch or over the walk or whenever and uh, get to know them and uh, they will be <laughs> carrying on um, for the future. So a big thank you to, to all of you and to all the trustees online as well. So um, we now move to the formal report, which is when we start to see some nice pictures. Um, we have a huge number of achievements over the year. And I just want to run through um, a, a, a few, um, highlighting the most significant ones. Um, and it's a whole hodgepodge. What, what you're always um, so aware of when I do this sort of thing is just the range of work, the sheer range of work that we do with people, with nature across the whole of Scotland it is absolutely extraordinary. So starting off, a major has to, uh, habitat restoration project at Dullator, um, which is a marsh wildlife reserve near Cumbernauld, 11,000 native trees planted and six wildlife ponds. Amazing achievement. Um, Ayrshire, I was in Ayrshire with the with with council with with our trustees um, earlier in the year, and we saw the uh, sand martin bank that's been constructed. Um, it's the sort of concrete structure at the end of the slide um, on the on the extreme my right. Um, I mean, there we were able to see how the river bank where the sand martin used to nest is sort of crumbling, and their habitat is disappearing, and then successive um, artificial structures have been created learning from experience and we've now got the most successful monitored sand martin bank in the uk because of this progressive work and it's just wonderful to visit and to see them using this structure that we've created for them as their natural habitat disappeared um, turning to our work with people um, we launched a new program called the next door nature pioneers program and this is a free skills development course and we're wanting to sort of seed community-led conservation right across scotland um, we started off this off in glasgow we then went to the fourth valley and our third cohort is being recruited right here on the east coast of scotland from Dundee to Aberdeen. So it's a free course to give people the schools, the skills to be the, the pioneers for nature for the future. And we see this project having lasting impact over decades. So um, I hope you'll spread the word about the opportunity here um, for, the, for the third cohort. And uh, I'll be watching to see the fruits of that coming forward in, in future years. Again, in Ayrshire, we completed an action in Ayrshire project um, lots of local volunteers bat boxes removing invasive plant species work that i'm sure you're very familiar with um, in the northwest of scotland we concluded the five-year koiga and ascent living landscape project 39 separate projects delivered again very much working with local people to benefit local wildlife people and the economy and when i do these presentations the team always like to throw in a sort of a problem for me. 
So I have to announce that we recorded the first sighting in Scotland, and apparently there's not even very many of these in England, of the sallow shoot piercer moth at the Trust's Cathkin Kath Marsh Wildlife Reserve. <laughs> Sorry, I nearly made it, not quite. But um, as Mark Young, I think many of you will know, um, verified this, um, this finding. We reckon that the, these um, rare moths have been on our reserve probably for decades, but nobody even knew they were there. And it's just wonderful to find new discoveries in these reserves that we're custodians for, for, for many decades. And of course, here in Aberdeen, we've got our amazing success story of the retreat of the gray squirrels and the steady return of red squirrels back to gardens and parks all the way to the center of the city. And those of you who are on the walk and are not familiar with Aberdeen, you might even spot one later in the walk this afternoon. And that is due to the fantastic efforts of the staff, the volunteers who carry out intensive control and monitoring across the city, over 7,000 checks of feeders last year alone, saving Scotland's red squirrels ambitious goal to achieve the first, line, the first mainland urban eradication. And that goal is now in sight. And many people believed it couldn't be done, but that, that here in Aberdeen, um, you, we are actually being successful in an urban mainland eradication. It's, it's quite amazing. Um, this year, we saw the lowest recorded density of, of gray squirrels since their introduction in the 1970s. And the expectation is there'll be, sorry, last year, this past year, it was the lowest recorded density of gray squirrels and we expect it to be even lower this year. So an amazing success story. Turning to what we're doing with people, um, we've, again, one of the legacies of the pandemic is huge popularity of our online events. So a wide range enjoyed by thousands of people and we've delivered six marine webinars by the Living Seas team. Um, we have Cumbernauld Living Landscape, re-wetting three urban peat bogs, um, which is really important for carbon storage for the future. We have hosted, again, closer to home here, um, students from right across Scotland at the Montrose Basin Visitor Centre for a special youth event prior to the 2022 Sea Scotland Conference. We've worked with partners. We're absolutely working with partners right across Scotland. We're certainly the organization, I think, in this area that works best with partners. So we've produced two short films on the benefits of hedgerow restoration and mob grazing for farmers. And that's part of our Nectar Network from Irvine, Irvine to Girvan. Underwater, we have launched new snorkel trails. These are extremely popular in showing people, um, and people often don't believe it, just how wonderful the marine life is of Scotland seas. And they go abroad to snorkel, and then they're surprised to find on our doorsteps. And we make it easy for people to know where to go. Um, and we inspire people with these wonderful snorkel trails. We have supported new wildlife watch clubs, inspiring young people in Caithness, in Perth and in Clydebank. We have secured funding for the first major phase of Riverwoods, which are, is our sort of new ambitious partnership initiative, creating a network of river woodlands across Scotland and that sort of connectivity theme and ensuring that we have sound ecological systems across the whole of Scotland is, is very much part of, of our ambition. We, turning to disseminating our knowledge, we presented findings from uh, a new report on urban nature-based solutions at a national conference with 300 people from planning departments, government, local authorities, ecologists. So again, trying to send these messages to the decision makers and planners and, and um, those who might um, be most able to make change in how we tackle nature in our planning system. We've engaged with young people and people facing barriers in their lives and asylum seekers in our Get Set Scotland partnership, which is with Scottish Badgers. Again, a very interesting initiative and innovative. 
We've launched the Oceans of Value film, which is stories from the people of Orkney about their relationship to the sea and the marine environment. And we're going to be showing some clips from this film later on. Um, we've been working on um, creating the sorts of stories and compelling arguments and cases for nature networks to again to send this message that we need to conserve nature at a landscape scale so we've been developing briefing for use with wider audiences beyond our members and again we've been able to attract the interest of key decision makers so they've been listening to this sort of activity we provided evidence in Parliament on the draft Scottish biodiversity strategy, and it is clear that the, um, the work that we did has positively influenced the next draft of, the, of that document. And turning to the work of our volunteers, we have supported over 950 volunteers to deliver an amazing 29,000 hours of volunteering ranging from osprey protection welcoming people off the ferry and lots and lots of work with invasive species grassroots work across the, the whole of scotland in terms of again influencing the big picture we pioneered thinking about natural capital in scotland and we have seen the scottish nature finance pioneers network grow to nearly 500 active and engaged members. Again, community leaders, investors, policymakers, academics, and we are supporting people working and thinking in these, in these areas. And we have welcomed, I'm very pleased to note, 3,100 new members to the trust over the last year. And a huge thank you. I'm not sure if any of them are here today or are, are online. But a huge thank you to everyone who's a member, and particularly to our new members. We're very, very pleased that you decided to join us, and thank you for your continued support. And finally, I should say that we were honoured to receive over £400,000 in legacy gifts throughout the year, and we were notified by 21 supporters that they have chosen to include a gift to the Scottish Wildlife Trust in, the, in their will. And we are hugely grateful for that support from our, our members. So a huge thank you to all our members, partners and funders. Thank you so much for the support that you provide and enable us to do all this wonderful work, working with you, our members and, and volunteers. So I would now like to invite Martin Cullen, who's the Director of Finance and Resources to summarise the financial position, having you given a brief outline of what we've managed to achieve over the year. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, hi, everyone. Um, this is my first, my first um, AGM, um, so bear, bear with me as I, I learn the ropes. Um, I think you'll appreciate the trust, like so many organisations this year's had to weigh the impacts of cost of living crisis and the inflationary pressures that brings. Um, and we're still still facing that when it comes to our finances. Um, the year we've just seen, that's had two principal impacts. We've had higher than average staff turnover, which led to capacity issues. Um, cost increases from suppliers, but also from wage increases in light of staff turnover and the cost of living pressures they face. Other cost pressures we've faced are, are there have been poor investment returns, there's adverse movements in our pension scheme asset, and a, a fall in legacy gifts relative to previous years. Um, these were the main reasons the, the Trust reported an unrestricted deficit of three quarters of a million pounds this year. Um, this compared to the unrestricted surplus of 1.35 million the preceding financial year. Um, but if, if we ignore, ignore investment returns and pension scheme movements, the unrestricted deficit was 200,000. Um, and that compared to surplus last year was 620,000. Um, and that reflects a, a more kind of um, realistic picture of our, how we operate day to day. Um, our budgets for the year expect a much larger deficit. Um, and that really illustrates the impact of staff capacity issues that we, we couldn't, couldn't deliver all our budgeted work we expected to. Um, 
I want to highlight that the reporting of a deficit isn't in itself a concern. Um, charities should be seen to be using their financial resources, albeit with long-term financial planning in place, um, to help achieve their objectives and strategies. Um, on the converse, generation of surpluses year on year can be looked on poorly by, by members, but also by um, other stakeholders and charity regulators have an ability to really to use donations and generous gifts and funding received. So it's a, it's a thin balance and it's not necessarily a bad sign of, of having, a, having a deficit. Um, um, long term, our financial plan is supported by both our free funds and our financial resilience designated reserve, the latter of which was created following generous legacy gifts in 2020. Um, these reserves are allowing us to recover from the impact of COVID, but also these current inflationary pressures and it also allows us to invest in fundraising activities to allow us to diversify our income streams and become more financially resilient in the long term. Um, our membership numbers um, are broadly stable. Um, the number of memberships at the end of March um, being 23,101, um, which is 31 more than last year. Um, and our members overall, 40,880, which is 250 less than the previous year. Um, we started the current financial year um, we're in right now um, by investing in fundraising activities to help increase these numbers and support from our members. Um, looking at the results um, of last financial year in a bit more detail, in terms of income, um, we continue to be hugely grateful to the support of members through subscriptions and donations, and we're always honoured to be in people's wishes um, and received, as, as Linda, Linda said, 400,000 in legacy gifts this year. Um, grant funders also continue to support the Trust, awarding us over £2.2 .2 million last financial year. We continue to be supported by the the, natural, the National Lottery Hedge Fund, the Players of People's Political Lottery, um, Edmund Fairburn Foundation, Nature Scott, and, and many others. Um, overall, our income did fall from 7.6 million to 5.1, um, but an important distinction here is between unrestricted and restricted income. Um, our restricted income fell around 400,000 to about 10%. Um, as a large factor here was a, a fall in, in legacy gifts relative to previous years, um, but that was offset by improvements elsewhere. Restricted income, on the other hand, fell almost 2 million, which is a 50% fall. Um, restricted income um, reflects money received to, that must be spent on particular specified purposes um, by donors and by funders. Um, that income will fluctuate year on year based on the, the number of projects our, our team are delivering and the stages are at. This year, we saw a number of projects coming towards an end, including the latest funded phases of Koi Kinasant Living Landscapes and Cumbernauld Living Landscapes, which were both um, funded by the National Heritage Fund. Um, we are we are looking to at the next phase of the latter one of, of Cumbernauld. Um, we also saw the uh, IC, IUCN, UK Peatland Programme, transfer to the Royal Society of Wildlife Trust due to a better fit uh, with the UK, UK remit. So a, a fall in income on our restricted side of work is, is expected and not a concern um, in itself. Um, as I said, we are working hard um, this year to secure new projects, that, that being um, running new phases of existing projects um, and also starting new ones like, like Riverwoods um, Initiative. Um, and this will help us ensure we continue to have impact in society, maintain a high profile and achieve our aspirations and visions as articulated in our strategy 2030. In summary, the end result was a decrease of 750,000 against unrestricted reserves and a downward movement of 630,000 in restricted reserves. Um, again, that reflecting the fact a number of projects are coming to a close. Um, our free funds remain within the target range set by Council. This guards us against financial risk, such as fluctuations in, in income and other un unexpected um, events. Um, we increase the size of our financial resilience designated reserve, so it allows us to continue existing levels of work and deliver our strategy, um, as well as invest in fundraising activities. This will require incurring deficit budgets um, until we can we forecast a breaking position uh, in our year end of 2028. Um, the financial outlook and unrestricted funds remain under close oversight and management by council in order to support the trust future within a post-COVID environment and as the cost of living crisis continues. Um, a quick note on, on the balance sheet, um, year on year our, our investment portfolios decreased around £400,000, which in effect reversed similar gains in the previous year. Um, and that really illustrates that financial markets remain, remain volatile. Um, our free funds ended the year at 1.2 million, um, broadly, broadly the same as the previous year, and our designated reserves totaled 4.2 million. 
Um, these reserves are designated ones, um, they exist to underwrite financial risk associated with our living landscape projects, Hoya Canassant and Cumberland. They afford our commitment to ongoing activities and investment and fundraising activities and help support our, our deficit repayment plans and other liabilities and uncertainties associated with our pension scheme. Um, the balance sheet remains strong. We retain strong cash resources to react fast to the needs of the trust and deliver our strategy. Um, trustees and staff, staff continue to proactively manage the activities and finances of the trust to achieve long-term vision, advance the conservation of Scotland's biodiversity for the benefit of the present and future generations. It would not be possible without the continued support of our members, funders, supporters, and we remain very grateful for that. Thank you. <coughs> Linda. So thank you, Martin. Um, so there will be an opportunity later on in the agenda to ask any questions that you have of Martin and other senior members of the, of the team. But for now, we shall move on um, through the formal part of the AGM agenda. And the next formal item is to reappoint the auditors. Um, Chain and Tate audited the trust. It's, it's just the second time um, that they've done that and they provided a comprehensive audit findings report to the Finance and Audit Committee and subsequently to Council. It went smoothly, no cause for concern was highlighted. And this is particularly concerning because obviously we've had a change in the leadership of our finance team um, during the year. And um, we're very grateful to Susan, our outgoing finance director, and we in, um, Martin has certainly hit the ground running and we've had a very smooth transition and I'm very grateful to both of them for um, for that um, for that work. Um, we have therefore assurance that our finances continue to be well managed and thanks to to all the team behind that being so. So um, Council is proposing that we appoint Chain and Tate again um, and I would like to invite membership to propose and second this if they are happy. Thank you. And sorry, your, your name? Sorry? Ronald McLean has proposed that. Thank you, Ronald. Could I have a seconder? The gentleman at the back. David Elson. Elston, thank you. Thank you very much for that. So um, I now turn to the results of the council election, which is the next formal bit of business. Um, we had two vacancies on council this year. We had two nominations, and I'll just briefly run through those. Um, both of them were existing council members and trustees open for re-election. Um, Alistair Lemon. Alistair has volunteered for the trust for a number of years. He sits on the conservation committee, our conservation committee. He was a young leader. He sat on the committee for the Stirling and Clackmannanshire local group. He has an honours degree in marine biology, a master's degree in wildlife biology. He's worked for Frog Life, Bug Life and the RSPB. And he currently works for Nature Scott as a marine ornithology advisor. And the second person is Emma Steele. Um, Emma lives in Orkney now. She grew up on her family's dairy farm in Stirlingshire. She has a degree in zoology and an MSc in environmental science um, from Aberdeen University. And she's working as the coordinator for the whale and dolphin conservation um, involving citizen science in the Northern Isles. And it's, it's lovely to have that diversity of, um, of uh, experience around the council table in terms of the geography of Scotland. So as the number of individuals standing for election is the same as the number of vacancies, both the individuals are therefore elected to council. And congratulations to you both. <laughs> You're both online, I know, so thank you for that. And thank you for agreeing to, to st stand again. So, and as I said, thanks to all those continuing on council for your continued and valued support. But looking forward, we now have Dr. Kenny Taylor coming in as the, the Trust's incoming chair um, I would like to wish him the best of luck. I'm sure you're going to really enjoy the experience and I know you have huge strengths that you will bring to the trust and uh, the trust will be very well led and under your um, leadership. 
Um, would you like to come up and just sort of say hello? Um, not much more than that. I don't think you can do it from where you're sitting is a, is a sad thing, Kenny. Oh, you've got a handheld mic. You can't, you don't even have to come up. Hello. <laughs> I'm just really looking forward to the, the next few years and um, <clears throat> I appreciate all that you've done over the last six years, Linda, because you've been just such um, a strong chair and very affable, allowing the business <laughs> to you know, proceed in a good way and uh, making yourself known across the country as you travelled around. and. I know it's hard for you to step down as we're approaching the 60th year. So um, I feel it for you because I'm really <laughs> looking forward to it. Whatever <laughs> that's it. Well, that's that's very kind, Kenny. I mean, don't say any more. I'll start no, crying, to be honest. <laughs> but Kenny, I think I mean, you'll, he'll be very different from me, which is really good for the trust as well. He lives in the Black Isle, not in Edinburgh, which will be really good for the trust as well. So it's, it's good to have change. Six years, it's been great but it's good for an organization to have new leadership and to refresh. So it's the right time to move on. It's the maximum I could stay anyway under the constitution. So, and, and Kenny is going to be absolutely super. Um, so thank you very much for those kind words and the best of luck. So we now turn to any other business and no notification was received of any other formal business. Therefore, I am now formally closing the 2023 annual general meeting. And there we are. And we're going to just um, move on as, as we move over. Um, Joe's going to give us a, um, um, a sort of overview of thoughts for the future, which I think is, is an interesting place. And we'll have our, um, our, our presentation from the local group and we'll have our uh, panel of our senior um, staff for, for questions and answers. But just as we introduce to that, we're going to have a short video of one of our interesting projects um, which comes from Cumbernauld. It's called Creating Natural Connections, and it's the latest phase to be completed, and it's, it's, it's rather good. And again, if anybody feels the need for a short break while this is playing, by all means, slip out and get yourself some water. Creating Natural Connections has been a four-year project to improve town green spaces and foster community connections. Despite the pandemic, the team and community achieved remarkable results. The project has transformed approximately 230 hectares of woodland, enhancing its management and biodiversity. We planted thousands of native trees, created wildlife ponds and restored peat bogs. Engaging with the community, we have reached hundreds of participants, delivered workshops and supported mental well-being through nature. worked with Cumbernauld Living Landscapes for quite some time. Um, the main project they helped us with was the Lang Rigs, um, which is a historic piece of open space in the village. Um, they helped us learn how to scythe. So we've got a fabulous wildflower meadow that we're trying to restore. They've also came down to give us a hand with our community orchard. Uh, we got some fantastic training to show how to maintain them, how to cut them back so we get the best harvest in the future. So we really do have a responsibility to try and improve biodiversity. Cumbernauld Living Landscapes has helped us to look at what we need to do and take practical steps to improve that. I help manage the Wildways Well program here at Cumbernauld Living Landscape. And the Wildways Well program is an attempt to provide people all the benefits of really nature-based sessions and therapy. I've seen a huge change in how comfortable people are with just being aware of what's around them. Being able to see people awaken to a sense of connection to the natural world is a huge gift of the program for me. Sometimes in conservation, what we've missed is the human element. And the beauty of the Wildways Well program has been it directly attempts to show people as being part of their natural world. And in doing so, they can feel a sense of, of pride, of ownership, of stewardship for that space. Hi, so I'm Kate and I'm the founder of Craigie Burn Community Garden. The project started because I came out of my front door and I looked at this green space and I just realised that no one was using it. So I decided to come out and start planting plants that I'd grown in my greenhouse. And then all of the neighbours saw me out of their windows and they decided that they'd join in as well. We've been working with Cumbernauld Living Landscape um, for the last six to seven months. We've actually been taking part in their training courses out of the residents living in our area of Cobrain because it's quite an economically deprived area. 
there is a lot of depression and also disabilities. So by having this area, people have found confidence again to go out and start finding new hobbies, such as looking at butterflies, identifying birds, and just basically taking pride in the general area again. My role at Creating Natural Connections involves lots of community engagement. I organise lots of different events and activities for the local community to attend. We get people outdoors into the amazing wild spaces that we have here. We've done everything from bat walks to early morning dawn chorus, birdsong ID walks. We've also done lots of pond dipping and bugger beastie hunts with children. The highlight for me about these events has been seeing how much people enjoy being outdoors, the enthusiasm on their faces and how eager they are to learn. We involve the public in choosing priority projects and have since upgraded pathways, restored three urban peat bogs, improved woodland management through thinning trees and planting over 13,000 saplings. Our woodland work improves biodiversity and benefits both people and wildlife. Over 250 metres of hedgerow have been planted, restoring lost habitats. So my role involves facilitating the Nature Ninja volunteering group. The main kind of activities that they carry out tend to focus on practical conservation skills and tasks. The Nature Ninjas have removed a lot of invasive non-native species. We've also removed over 200 bags of litter to see the community come together and to share their knowledge, to share skills that they've got. We've got one volunteer that makes chilli jam for everyone. To see them all create their own little community within themselves has been really inspiring and really lovely to watch because they're all from different walks of life. I left uh, a previous role within childcare in a really low place due to mental health reasons. First I joined the project volunteering and that kind of helped get me out of the house, got me back out meeting people again and just being in nature really helped. Probably the biggest impact I think it has had on me is just hope, like hope for the future now. So that was that was really lovely. I, I was at Cumbernauld for the start and the end of this project, and just seeing the um, the enthusiasm of the people, the brownies running around, the sort of organised chaos, and just the happiness of people being together. It was just absolutely wonderful. And I mean, you really got the flavour of it from that from that film. So excellent. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to our chief executive, Joe Pike, who will be sharing some thoughts on the future. Thank you, Linda. And I'm really sorry I can't be with you all today. I was looking forward to chatting with everybody, but unfortunately I've come down with something. Uh, I can safely say uh, you probably wouldn't want to catch it from me. Uh, but fortunately, thanks to the wonders of LEMSIP and Zoom, uh, I'm at least able to participate remotely. Um, so in the next few minutes, I'll do the traditional looking ahead, which I've broken down into three key themes. First, uh, our big milestone, um, I'm sure everybody is now absolutely clear what that is. Uh, second, the ever-increasing diversity of people we'll be working with as we move forward. And third, an important opportunity for members to get involved. So, just in case you haven't noticed, the Trust has a big milestone on the horizon. It's our 60th anniversary in 2024. And April is the actual month, month of the anniversary, but we'll be looking to mark the occasion in different ways throughout the year. And I'll say up front that uh, I'm not about to let you in, into the secret of all of our planned celebrations. That's not because it's classified information. It's because the plans are still being drawn up. But what I can say about the anniversary is that it will be a chance to celebrate how far we've come in the last six decades and build on these foundations to increase our resilience for the challenges and opportunities ahead. On our wildlife reserves, we'll be increasing our focus on measuring and monitoring so that we can better demonstrate the difference we're making for wildlife for example, through interventions such as our much-loved flying flock. We'll also be turning the spotlight on monitoring and measuring in our ongoing work on the Edinburgh Nature Network in partnership with the City of Edinburgh Council. And that's happening through a project called Thriving Green Spaces as part of the Edinburgh Living Landscape. And we very much hope that this will serve as a blueprint for other local authorities across Scotland. 
Meanwhile, we'll be progressing our landscape restoration ambitions for one of our three largest wildlife reserves, Lagiban. It's an ambitious project with all sorts of complexities uh, associated with access infrastructure like roads and bridges, um, but we're confident of moving forward and taking the first steps in our restoration journey focused on woodlands and peatlands. Our wildlife reserves are, of course, important parts of the wider landscape. And another thing we're looking forward to, which has already been mentioned um, by Linda, because it's a, a great part of our success last year, um, is the Irvin Skirvin Nectar Network. And we're looking forward to expanding that. And I think it's fair to say it's enjoyed huge, enjoyed huge popularity recently as more and more habitat for pollinators has been created by the growing number of partners. So talking of partners, there will be important developments in some of our other major partnership initiatives in the coming year. We're hoping for a positive result from our funding application to deliver the next phase of Humbernauld Living Landscape. And I love the video that we've just seen, um, which is so nice. So please do keep your fingers crossed um, for that funding application to come through. Um, also, the funding application that we'll submit in February to enable us to move from the development to the delivery stage of Riverwoods um, to help us start, as you've already heard, realising our exciting collective vision of a network of healthy riverbank woodlands and healthy, healthy river systems across Scotland. Um, in fact, we had, a, we had a great session this week with Riverwoods Partners. It was uh, facilitated by uh, somebody called Chris from a charity called Involve. And we've been drawing on advice from an academic in Toronto called Pranita Mudalia, looking at innovative ways of developing a governance structure which has multiple decision centres, so-called so polycentric governance. Um, but it's all really about enabling us to take Riverwoods to scale and ensuring that the vision is owned by as many people as possible. And we had a, a great response to those uh, early discussions um, at the session on, on Wednesday. Um, we also want to build on the incredible success of Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels, particularly here in, in Aberdeenshire, and we'll be looking to establish a sustainable future for red squirrel conservation that sees other partners embedding this in, in their own work. So to celebrate these successes and many, many more, we will be launching a storytelling campaign for our 60th anniversary, um, and we'd love you to start thinking about any stories you'd like to tell uh, or would like to hear and watch this space. So the next slide is a reminder, many of you will have seen this graphic before, of what is increasingly recognised internationally as what needs to be achieved between now and 2030, as well as beyond. We need to halt the loss of biodiversity by the end of this decade and then reverse that loss and see full recovery by 2050. And I'll say more about Scotland's ambitions in relation to that in a minute and how members can help. So it's clear from the size of the task that we need to get as many people as possible behind the effort to reverse the loss of biodiversity in Scotland. And the Trust is working with a really diverse range of people from, from refugees to research scientists and so many more, each of whom is making a contribution that is valued and unique. Now, in our Next Door Nature programme, this is a picture from the Next Door Nature programme. Um, you'll have heard from, from Linda that that's a, a UK wide a project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. People often tell us that they would love to see more nature in their local area, but they don't really know where to start. So this is about working with partner organisations and communities. And we're focused very much on what we call the multiplier effect. So working with others who can help us reach even more people through um, their own networks. And uh, you've also heard that the next cohort after the current one in the fourth catchment will actually be focusing on communities between Dundee and Aberdeen. Now this programme, the funded programme, uh, comes to an end in June uh, and before that happens we will launch a nature recovery showcase that will go live early in the next in the new year uh, as part of a, a broader new community focused online resource that we're developing. Some, something we've not announced yet is that we're discussing, it, discussing an exciting potential new partnership that could help us deliver the next phase of our community leadership work, including innovative uses of technology as well as uh, practical on the ground opportunities to, to restore nature after the Next Door Nature funding finishes next June. So that, that's kind of in um, discussion at the moment. Now, um, of course, beyond uh, our work with communities, we will continue to be working with nearly a thousand volunteers, which is um, extraordinary when you, you think about how many ways people contribute to the Trust's work. Um, and a quick check of our website this morning shows we're currently looking for a, a volunteer cattle checker in Bathgate, as well as wildlife watch leaders and wildlife watch helpers in Orkney, Forest, Perth and Roslyn Glen. 
So there's never a shortage of, of variety in what we're looking for. We're also working with a diverse range of stakeholders in different sectors now, and that's largely through the Scottish Forum on Natural Capital and its various subgroups. So looking ahead to the coming year, um, for example, we'll be supporting the Scottish Nature Finance Pioneers, which is one of the um, hubs within the Scottish Forum, to help pioneer the development of a community benefits standard as part of a coalition of organisations, including the Community Woodlands Association, Finance Earth, the University of Strathclyde, and a new organisation called Deciding Matters. Uh, and that project has just literally this week received the thumbs up for funding um, from the new facility for investment ready nature in Scotland, otherwise known as Ferns. Um, and that itself is a funding programme whose creation we strongly advocated for um, following our previous work um, on the billion pound challenge. So um, my third and, and final key message, and it really couldn't be more important is that we are in course incredibly fortunate to be a membership charity and our members are at the heart of the trust so i'm going to set you a little challenge in a minute for your conversations in the comfort break uh, after the q a um but let's just remember that our members support the trust's work in a huge number of ways giving us the financial bedrock that makes so many of our activities possible but also getting actively engaged in in many of these now one of the important ways in which members can play a role in helping the trust to deliver our vision is by ensuring that we have a strong collective voice for nature. And looking ahead, there's an unusually large number of Scottish Government consultations coming up on everything from agriculture policy to grouse moor management and, and fisheries management. And it's particularly important to note that the launch this week, actually, um, of the consultation on Scotland's strategic framework for biodiversity. And that includes lots of different things, including the Scottish biodiversity strategy, the first five-year delivery plan of that strategy and the proposed natural environment bill. It's a rather lengthy set of proposals, but it includes some really super important content. Um, one of the things is legally binding nature targets, and that's something, as many of you will know, we've been actively calling for in order to help ensure that nature is on a par with climate change when it comes to government priorities and resources. I showed you the graph at the beginning of the presentation highlighting that we need to halt the loss of biodiversity by 2030. That target features in the Scottish Government's draft biodiversity strategy, along with a target to have restored and regenerated biodiversity across our land, freshwater and seas by 2045. In the near future, we'll be launching an online campaign which will help members respond to this consultation. However, um, I promised you a challenge. So to get you thinking in advance of this, I'm going to pose a question which I hope will spark some interesting conversations in your break. Um, so here it is. What is the one thing that the Scottish Government could do that would make the biggest difference to nature's recovery? Get your thinking caps on and you'll have a chance to feed some of these ideas into the consultation when our campaign goes live. Um, but also, I hope it sparks some interesting discussions here today. Now, that's just one example of how members can make a difference. Members also play a hugely important role as conveners for many of our wildlife reserves and, of course, get engaged in practical conservation and much more. And it hardly needs to be said that our network of local groups are doing fantastic things that you are no doubt looking forward to hearing about today in relation to the Aberdeen Group. Groups provide a vitally important local face of the Trust, increasing our impact and our relevance, as well as the incredible diversity of activities undertaken across Scotland. And I'd like to say a special thank you to the Aberdeen Group for your role as hosts of today's AGM. I know a huge amount of work has gone on behind the scenes between the group and Jill Hatcher in the Edinburgh office. So a very well done and um, thank you. Finally, uh, a quote that I've shared before and that can't be shared often enough. Um, and that is that making peace with nature is the defining task of the 21st century. So I'd just like to say a very big thank you um, to all of you for your support um, and we'll be participating in the question and answers. Um, and again, sorry, I can't be with you today. Thank you. Get well soon. <laughs> thank you, Linda. So we now have the opportunity for questions from the floor. I'd like to invite um, the senior management to come up and maybe huddle around the table. Um, for those of you online, if you could use the Q&A function on your screen, 
and you can then see questions that other people are asking and if there's a particular question that you would like to see answered you can use the thumbs up to vote that question up and for those of you in the room please raise your hand if you have a question and i'll be looking at jillian who's looking at the thank you um, to see what whether we've got questions coming through online because i really do want the online folk to have an opportunity to ask questions at this point since they can't do it over later in the agenda. So who would like to ask the first question? Okay, so, um, we have one question through Zoom, um, which is, what is the Trust's views on the figures released in the press on the 3rd of September regarding management slash culling of wildlife? So I think this is a question for Sarah. Yeah, sure, happy to take that. Um, this is, I presume, to do with the Nature Scots license return numbers, which are provided every August, more or less, um, across the piece. And we haven't proactively sort of stepped into this space because the debate is often very polarized. But what we have always made very clear is that broadly, we take the view that we shouldn't interfere um, with native wild animals um, and particularly healthy populations of native wild animals. But we do recognise that the result of human actions, you know, as a result of human actions, much of Scotland's ecosystems are depleted um, and severely degraded. And the loss of keystone species or the introduction of invasive non-native species means that we do have to step in and manage wildlife on occasion. So there are situations where we and many of our projects um, and our our reserves work is involved in culling wild animals um, but we always do that um, with the greatest consideration to to what the impact would be and whether there truly is a need there so that's something that we take very seriously and we do also call for greater transparency in the nature scott licensing um, process and have constantly called for a sort of evidence-based approach to that process as well um, most recently, I guess, with the beavers um, and the culling licenses there. And, and the grey squirrels is presumably an example of this? So. Certainly, yeah. So that's the management of an invasive non-native to support the, the um, red squirrels to thrive here in Scotland. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, at the back. Sorry, there's a roving mic coming to you. What is the society's view on the highly protected marine areas um, and the decision to not go forward with the highly protected marine areas, given the fact that we, we are told that 37% of the seas are in marine protected areas, despite the fact that very little of those areas have any form of protection? We were, of course, naturally very disappointed, having worked quite hard to try and get ourselves to the place where uh, we were almost on the verge of getting this kind of protection and highly protected marine areas. Um, uh, one thing, though, is, is important is that in any of these kinds of new ideas and introductions, we really, really need to bring people with us. And so we need to make sure that uh, those people that feel as though they have a stake in this, as you've seen in the Community Voices uh, video that, that you will see in a, uh, after the break, um, it's really important that they are part of the conversation. So at this stage, we do support the further conversation, although we are in, a, in an emergency, a nature emergency, so we do need to be fairly fast, but we need to bring people as well. So quite a nuanced answer there. Is that uh, respond to your question? Well, given the fact um, the rest of the UK have already brought in highly protected marine marine, marine areas, only only uh, three of the five, I think, think it was. Um, and given the, the, the actual approach that the Scottish government um, used, where they went directly to the people, I mean, I, I, I'm no longer in government, so, and I haven't been in government for a couple of years. So, so I can say this having, having been highly involved in marine protected areas in Scotland. Um, but the whole approach seemed to be one where they went to the community 
and it just seemed to cause an awful lot of um, unnecessary concern, knowing myself exactly which areas are, are fished, heavily fished, um, which areas would be most suitable when you have communities frightened that uh, their coastal areas would become um, stopped is totally and utterly um, opposite to what we've seen in all the um, the scheme so far. And we've had we, we have these large marine protected areas, the largest area we have in Scotland, that's a marine protected area and in, in, in the deep sea, deep sea area. That area was formed because of a EU bill deciding that fishing was going to be stopped between 600 and 800 meters. And so you've, so we have a large area that is, was already protected is out from from a European bill. So really, it's it seems to me there wasn't really much support. I didn't hear when I when I when I saw saw all the alarming talk. I didn't see any of the NGOs um, discussing the proposal. Um, the Scottish government were. Um, started with a consultation without any guidance at, at all and i thought the whole whole thing was uh, really showed how you know how you can use uh, a what is a sensible conservation um approach um but advertise it badly and don't support it and don't explain it how things can go so seriously wrong and I think that's a, that's a very interesting and useful point. Yeah, thank you. And I mean, I, I, I think you'll have heard from everything that's been presented today, how the Scottish Wildlife Trust is very much in this space of working with people, obviously um, being absolutely clear about the science and the conservation imperative, but the people dimension is a very important aspect to get right. And if you get it wrong, ultimately you damage your objectives. So thank you, I think it's a very useful point. Lady at the back. Um, I'm not used to speaking publi publicly, so uh, excuse me, but I think the, um, the highly protected marine areas have been paused, not cancelled, but been paused for more public consultation. And I was also really disappointed that the pause was necessary, but it was taken, I think, with a lot of um, yeah, it wasn't an easy decision, but I think that's for me a really important difference. Things. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely, that there are um, these are tricky things to get right, um, but you do have to get them right, and I think that's the point that was made. Um, what I, I will say, um, coming coming in today, um, Martin, and this is his very first AGM, and it's the first time he's worked for a charity, so he's a bit nervous about the questions that he would get. And I said to him, don't worry, the, the finance director never gets any questions. Um, <laughs> so you've got an opportunity now to prove me wrong. <laughs> so any more questions online? Yes. So David is asking, any news on the reintroduction of species such as lynx and wolves? Ooh, another interesting one, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Back um, to Sarah. Okay. There's, I, I mean, wolves, I would say, is is off the agenda for Scotland. I think it's fair to say um, we've got quite a task making links a palatable option for a lot of people out there. But there are conversations continuing um, and you'll have seen some of the work that Scotland, the big picture are doing on um, working with communities to discuss whether this is something they want, the communities that have to live with the consequences, both positive, I think, and negative. Um, in some cases of the species being returned to Scotland. So that that's a very live conversation at the moment. I know the Wildlife Trust is exploring options for Kilda Forest, but that's south of the border, um, but obviously not far from the border. So uh, we're hoping to have some more conversations with them in the coming weeks about that project specifically. Um, but the National Species Reintroduction Forum, which is um, convened by Nature Scott has been a bit slow to meet in recent years, um, and I'm hoping that that comes back together because that's the forum where these sort of things are pushed forward and discussed um, in more depth. 
Good. Thank you, Sarah. Gentleman at the front here. And then we'll see if there's another one on, online after that. Gentleman here. Please could you explain why wolves are off the agenda? Wolves have made a remarkable recovery throughout Europe over the past few decades. You now have wolves living in the Netherlands. I think that the Netherlands is one of the most densely populated countries in Europe. If wolves can live in the Netherlands, surely they can live in the highlands of Scotland. I think a few years ago, the idea of introducing beavers to Scotland would have been off the agenda for many people, including many fishermen. And there's still many fishermen out there who don't like beavers because they think they eat fish. So again, why are wolves off the agenda? <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. I'm afraid you sort of walked into that. Oh, one, no, but, yeah, uh... no, no, it's absolutely fine. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, Scotland could host wolves from an ecological perspective, but it's the people landscape that's the problem here because, and some of that has got to do with beavers. Um, you know, the reintroduction of beavers to Tayside was not undertaken in any consultative way whatsoever. And so that has created this, this sort of fear amongst huge sections of the population who are incredibly influential in these spaces. Um, around reintroductions more generally um, and particularly you know there is a hierarchy of reintroductions um, and wolves are seen to be at the top alongside bears uh, so I think you know people are, are fairly um, you know or the the land owning and farming fraternity who have a natural uh, you know there's a huge portion of them naturally against reintroductions because of the impact it may have on them negatively um, and there are a lot of fishermen still against beavers because of the damming, um, not necessarily because of the, the, you know, the incorrect perception that they eat fish. Um, there's concerns around, you know, salmon stocks in particular in the damming that, it, that may impact on them from beavers. And there's a lot of negative feeling towards the beaver situation. So unfortunately, the people landscape is sort of saying, look, we haven't got that right. So don't even come and knock on my door and talk to me about anything else that's more contentious or more challenging. Um, that's not what the trust think in terms of why, you know, we've always advocated for the return of, of formerly native species, but we do appreciate that to have a successful reintroduction and through our, our vast experience with beavers to have a successful reintroduction that does need to be um, understanding from a wide spectrum of people in Scotland that this is this is po plausible, possible, and um, acceptable. Thank you. Question from the back. So I think we're about to run out of time, but I've got a question here. Which could be the, has the last question? Yeah. yeah, that she would like to answer live. Um, so this is going back to the original question about um, culling. Um, Please can the stand back approach Sarah talks about be put to the vote of the trust members? So Joe said you'd like to answer this one. Thank you, Jill. And in fact, I'll combine it with an answer to another question from, I believe, the same questioner, um, which says there is a potential conflict of interest with many SWT links to Nature Scott. What governance is used to manage these? So I think it, both of these relate to governance, actually. The in the first instance, about whether uh, an approach could be put to the vote of, of members. The key point is that all of the trust's policies and positions um, on anything uh, ecological, as opposed to HR policies and so on, um, go to our conservation committee for scrutiny. Conservation committee is made up of trustees and also external experts. Conservation committee will then uh, make a recommendation to council um, whether or not to approve the policy uh, or position or whether it needs more work from the staff team. So council are obviously elected by members, and that's the approach that we take, um, rather than going out on all of our policies and positions to the whole of the membership. Um, on the other governance point regarding how we manage conflicts of interests, we uh, maintain uh, a register of interests for all of our trustees. Um, and so if any potential uh, interest is registered in that, should that result in an actual conflict of interest, then we have a, a well sort of tried and tested procedure um, whereby that, that trustee would be excluded from those particular discussions. I don't know whether Linda wanted to say any more, but hopefully that answers that question. I think that 
covers it. And I think um, we bring the questions to an end at this point. I think there's a lot of issues there and there are not easy answers to these things. And again, as you work through them, you see wider perspectives. The trust is keen to ensure that we meet our objectives and the council takes a lot of consideration about what the best way of doing that is and that is how we reach the position that we're that we're in and, and, and we set out exactly what our range of activity is um but these are not easy questions and faced with climate emergency conservation challenges where should the trust position itself are very legitimate questions very legitimate member questions from the membership and you give us something to reflect on and that's and that is good and sound so thank you for that and the conversations can continue um, through the rest of the day. So we're going to take a short 10 minute break now for comfort reasons. Um, can you try and get back for well, 11.20? And it's literally a 10 minute break. So 11.20, if you can manage it. Um, sorry, 12.20. It says 12.20. I read 11.20 for some reason. <laughs> um, please return by 12.20. And it is now 12.11, so um, <laughs> that's entirely reasonable. You see why you need a new chair. <laughs> so return by 12.20, and then we're going to have Roger, who's going to come and tell us about all the amazing things which the local group are doing here in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. So thank you for that. Excuse me, folks, including our new chair. <laughs> Good start. <laughs> so, so <laughs> I'll come to your AGM next year. <laughs> Girls trouble. So, um, without um, prolonging things, I just want to invite Roger from the Aberdeen and Aberdeen Chariot local group to come up to the stage and tell us about all the exciting things that you're doing here in Aberdeen. Uh, thank you very much. Good to see you all. We're delighted, absolutely delighted that you've come to Aberdeen. Um, I didn't realize just how influential the trust is until I saw the North Sea Har actually retreat offshore <laughs> as soon as you arrived here. But this is, um, um, I want to talk to you actually about the, in a very short space of time, about the wildlife highlights of Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Shire. And a little bit at the end about what we're doing uh, in terms of facilitating all of this. But this is um, a talk that's been put together by not only by myself, but by David Elston over there, who's a former chair of, of the group. And currently he's a very important treasurer of the group <laughs> and, uh, and also reco a BSBI recorder for King Cardinshire and North Aberdeenshire. But, uh, well, uh, just in case you don't know, Aberdeenshire is that bit that goes st um, from Cullen on the North Morayshire coast all the way down. It cuts into the Cairngorm National Park, so that shaded area there, Balatibramar is Cairngorm National Park, so it's all the way into there, and then comes to the sea just north of Montrose. It's got, amazingly, I mean, it's got about nearly 10% of the population of Scotland here, half of which is in Aberdeen City. It's got a land area which is eight percent of um, of Scotland, so pretty significant. Why do you know what underlies the biodiversity of Aberdeenshire? Really importantly, is the vast number, the diversity, the sheer diversity of habitat. Right from the Arctic Alpine Plateau in the west of Aberdeenshire, right up to the Cairngorms there. We've got lots of, obviously, as you know, locks and rivers. We've got um, Caledonian pine woods. We've got a lot of upland heath. Uh, these upland pastures, deciduous woodlands, a lot of wetlands and, and peatlands. Of course, we also have a lot of agriculture in the northeast of Scotland and those urban areas. And of course, we also have some fantastic coasts and cliff habitat. Um, really worth seeing if you haven't seen them. I'll just let, just reflect on something here that if you go west and you go to the Cairngorm National Park, then of course, as you already all know, there are many iconic species 
that we're protecting. So everything that you can, you know, the Kengom National Park has the, the capercaillie, the red squirrel, the alpine south thistle, the, the wildcat and so on. But did you know that um, the rivers, so the River D and the, um, is, a, is an SAC, the whole of the river and the catchment. So the designated species in there include the otter, freshwater pearl mussel, salmon, of course. By the way, in that bottom uh, left-hand corner, I insist on putting in a aquatic invertebrate nymph because that's my speciality, that's my trade. So I, <laughs> there's a stonefly nymph for you. Um, but in there, in that in that two percent of Scotland's land area, the Kengom National Park is are twenty five percent of the UK's rare and threatened species. So that includes part of Aberdeenshire. Uh, I thought we thought we we should let you know where to find some great biodiversity. First of all, in case you don't know. So the first thing I'm going to do is just tell you. This is going to be quick. I'm just going to tell you where the national nature reserves are that you really should visit starting with Forvi on the Ithan estuary, beautiful area of dunes, heath, coastal area. There's the Muir of Dennett up Deeside, two big lochs, fantastic birch woods, uh, um, mountain uh, heath, uh, glacial features that you really would die for if you were a glaciologist. It's, um, the, there's Glen Tanner, I was there just the other day, beautiful pine wood all the way up the Glen, Capercaillie in there, you just keep away from them really. <laughs> um, Marlodge Estate is the biggest natural nature, national nature reserve in the UK. It's got 29,000 hectares of Caledonian forest, heath, mountain, um, all those iconic species. It's, uh, it's, it's a beautiful place to visit. If you haven't been there recently, go, because if you just took a walk from Derry Lodge, uh, from Linnardy to Derry Lodge, you'll see all this amazing regenerating pine. It's, it's just fantastic. And then there's St. Cyrus on the coast just north of, uh, squeezed between these ancient volcanic cliffs and the beach, and great for botany. There's even Nottingham catchfly there, <laughs> David, isn't it? <laughs> it was a, and many other um, uh, species of plant that you wouldn't find anywhere else. It's, it's the, the northern limit for some of them. But we really need to talk about, just briefly, about the, our own reserves, the trust reserves, the ones that are here that this, the local group has involved with. So first of all, Gicht is a uh, Gicht woodland, which is actually sits on uh, beside the Ithan, the River Ithan. It's a deciduous woodland, but it's still got conifer plantations in it, and all of that is being managed. So Zach over here, Zach Brown, the seasonal ranger, uh, Rab, and our convener, Mark Young. We're really lucky to have Mark Young as a convener here. Uh, they're still doing a lot of management here in terms of planting, taking out the conifers, replanting the, um, the deciduous trees. In fact, the local group have just established a tree nursery, which I'll say something about later uh, to help with this. And uh, not long ago, a speckled wood appeared. I was, this was really amusing because I was there with Mark Young and a group of members. And Mark was bemoaning the fact that the uh, speckled wood hadn't yet appeared. When, what, when we were having our lunch and a member said, there's one. Uh, and, he, and, and Mark immediately notebook out, yes, you're right. <laughs> it, was just, it was just tremendous, isn't it? When you get that kind of, that happens in front of you. Uh, Longhaven Cliffs, um, this is uh, just south of Peterhead. We, this is an absolutely stupendous area. It's a long strip of coastal cliff that we got from a quarrying company years ago because they were going to build a super quarry here. They were going to build Rotterdam Harbour with it, in fact, with all the granite. And in fact, we've, a consortium of people saw them off. The end result was that we got to manage this beautiful sea cliff area which is full of, of course, full of amazing seabirds. Here's a picture from Ian Francis of razor bills. If you want to see razor bills, go there. And of course, even seals haul out there. If you want to see gray seals, go to Longhaven. Really worth a visit to Longhaven. It's a spectacular. On the other hand, and by contrast, we have a small uh, 
wildlife flower meadow part of the way up uh, D side um, orchids here we manage that for for the for the wildflowers and finally let me just talk about the red moss of Netherley which is just south of Aberdeen it's north of Stonehaven uh, I live not far from there it's a it's a one of the best examples of a raised bog in the northeast of Scotland we manage it for that it's been in the past cut for peat and we're drained so all of that has to be you know is being managed and fixed over time here if it for example is some some time ago is a an image of um uh the red you know uh, an aerial image of of the moss uh and you see the wetland areas and after a management and damming and so on here's what it looked like you see the the wetland areas have increased substantially and that's worked and we're really grateful for all the effort that goes in with the rab potter and zach and our volunteers but we're really lucky to have rose tony and nick littlewood as our conveners because they really look after it and they're really keen on this place and rose and nick in fact um, do a lot of monitoring fantastic amount of monitoring they're very inventive too so they have trail cameras with mammal small mammal tubes on them and if dan this might work if dan can play yeah, there you see, this is, they could, they're recording small mammals in this tube. What, what, it's just incredible. <laughs> yeah, and because of all the recording they do, there's some amazing things turned up. So, for example, hieroglyphic ladybird, and you see its distribution is pretty limited, and they found that. Um, so in that terms of all the recording they do, it just shows you that the effort pays off. So in 2010, there were three mammals recorded there. By 2021, there were 24 mammals recorded there, and so on with moths, butterflies, everything else. Uh, I really should just quickly rattle through the fact that there are some other reserves that we don't <laughs> we don't manage that you really should visit if you don't know them. And one is uh, the, the RSPB reserves, Troop Head. If you want to see this, it's got the biggest mainland gannet population um, there's Cranach wood a beautiful tranquil wood uh, ballata there's the Lochestrath beg the biggest dune loch in Scotland if not UK and then there's Fowl's Hugh 130,000 seabirds breed there in a year in and just south of Stonehaven and you really should visit that too there are local nature reserves in Aberdeen city um i can't just i can't describe them all to you but the the the, the Dunmouth is the one if you're going on this trip and this walk this afternoon Dunmouth is where we're going um scottstown moor den of maiden craig kinkorth hill they're all worth visiting and then even the the shire has a a moss on hole moss west of aberdeen and up in fraserburgh the water of philoth but i i can only point to you to the fact that you should go and visit them because what I want to do now in the remaining time is just tell you a little bit about some very special species that you wouldn't probably expect to see in this part of the world, but for and, and they're really special. So the mountain burnet moth, which is uh, inhabits um, heath somewhere between 650 meters and 1000 meters altitude. And the caterpillar there is this vivid black and Yellow caterpillar feeds on crowberry and blaeberry and, and heather. And its distribution only found 10 colonies at Bremar, west of Bremar, just west of Bremar. That's the only place where they're found so far, anyway. So, isn't that, that pretty special? <laughs> what about the brown bordered lacewing? Have you heard of that? The brown bordered lacewing on the, on the cliffs. In Kincardine Cliffs, the Aberdeenshire coast here, uh, around about Stonehaven and so on, the brown bordered lacewing, and it feeds on the aphids, which themselves feed on wood sage. Its distribution there, strangely, sorry, can you see that? Around the Kincardineshire coast and Holyrood Park. So we have a connection, a royal connection there. I, I, you know, why is that? Because it likes that particular kind of cliff habitat. Let me tell you about Dickie's bladder fern. You really have to hear about Dickie's bladder fern because it was discovered in 1842 by a professor here, William Knight, 
um, who, in, uh, who, who found it in some sea caves um, of, on the Aberdeenshire coast. It's been found in other places, a few other places since. But David rediscovered it in the sea caves <laughs> in Aberdeenshire, but they get, they, it's a very limited distribution. My special favorite, very special species, the world known world distribution of this bramble, this blackberry, bramble, Rubus longiflora, is only here in Angus and in Kincardenshire. It's, it's got this rigid sort of stem, but anyway, it, you only find it there so far. <laughs> And the common crane, what about that? In the northeast of Scotland, of course, this, um, we have common crane in the, in the old peat uh, scrapes. It's, it kind of, it, it, it's breeding there. And this year, in 2023, I think it was, yeah, there was five pairs there, four young were fledged. And RSPB are asking if SWT volunteers would mind assisting tracking with, and helping with crane recording. So if any of you are interested, please come forward. And I should mention the bottlenose dolphin, of course, off Aberdeen. Aberdeen is well known. Harbour, in the harbour for seeing dolphin. I used, my office used to be looked right down on. I spent all day looking at dolphin out of my <laughs> office window. And this is, of course, the Grey Hope Bay Centre that you can see now. I'm moving on quickly, <laughs> um, but you know, in Aberdeen, we have threats to biodiversity too. And uh, this, the local group are very much involved in discussions with local authorities and so on to preserve the sites that there are there. Scottsdale Moor is one where we're, we're currently engaging with Aberdeen City Council about tree planting there and what the right tree in the right place. This is another one. This is. Aberdeen, the Aberdeen Harbour Extension Project and the Aberdeen Energy Transition Zone, which essentially by the brand new harbour that they've built, they want to actually build this industrial estate on top of the, one of the best green spaces in Aberdeen, the St. Fittix Park, which is uh, um, what local residents of Torrey regard as their kind of back gardens because they don't have any others. And this is, this is really um, unfortunate because they want to cover over an award-winning restoration project for Tullis Brown. However, you can see there's two sides to every argument, but we, we, we really feel that it's the wrong place for that. So those sorts of threats we're engaged with. Um, the oyster plant, David discovered that the oyster plant, which was there, has already gone extinct. And it's an IUN near-threatened species. Um, just very quickly, uh, ben, the, we embarked upon this local group project called Ranging for Nature, very much uh, originally led by Rose Tony, and and we we got a grant of fifteen thousand from Aberdeen Voluntary Action, and what what we're doing with that, we're equipping volunteers so they can go out and do conservation projects. We are teaching nature conservation skills to groups. We want to reach a wide and diverse group across the northeast. We've established already a native tree nursery. I persuaded my next door neighbor to have a tree nursery on his land. And he said, yeah, all right then. So I've, I've got a tree nursery uh, there. This is first we're gonna, thing we're gonna do is help with the trees for Gicht, for the planting at Gicht, our reserve at Gicht. But we're also very keen on loaning equipment and we've got, we've, we've got with this money, we've got um, various wildlife recording equipment we've bought, but we wanna loan it to schools and teach them how to use it. We think that's really important. So that's me, <laughs> and uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, this is what Aberdeen has to offer and Aberdeenshire has to offer. That's the, what the local group are up to. Uh, we have um, volunteer groups doing all of these things, working on the reserves, but we're just doing our bit to halt biodiversity loss as much as we possibly can. Thank you. That was amazing, Roger, and so inspirational. And thank you for the passion and the knowledge that you bring, and also for your vision for how you can enthuse others going forward. That is absolutely brilliant and very special. And I hope we can share more of that sort of approach. So time is getting on. Um, we have um, one last item, and that is, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, we wanted to show you a little bit from the Orkney 
community um, Oceans of Value project. Um, this is a, a film that's been made as part of that project. What we're planning to do is just to show you an excerpt from it. it resonates a bit with some of the themes that we're talking about in the Q&A session as well, which I think make it quite interesting. And it takes us from, um, from the botany and the, and the little, little beasties into the marine world and, and the people connected with that. So again, part of this big picture that the, the Wildlife Trust is involved with. So let's have a very short um, excerpt from the Oceans of Value project film. The story of an island without the story of the sea is, well, it's ridiculous, really. You can't do it. Living on an island is very much about the sea, almost sometimes more than about the land. There's over 70 islands. That's a huge length of coastline compared with the land mass. I think it's very important in many people's lives. I think like any island group, the sea is the most dominant factor. When you live on an island, of course, there's sea on every side. <laughs> to come and go, you have to fly over the sea or go on a ship. The sea was never seen as a barrier. It's seen as the highway. You traveled by sea. I've been working in Stroms Museum photographing their artifacts for a number of years now and it would be really hard to think of any of the artifacts in there that do not have a, a relationship with the sea and when I'm working there handling the artifacts I get the sense of how deeply rooted the sea is in, in our culture here. Now there's a lot of them. There's definitely creel, that's the kind of cage that you use to catch crabs and lobsters. Crabs are a lot of the time they're called partons. You've got selkie for seal, although that's kind of a mythological term. You've got bonksy, that's the name for a great skewer, and it's a coastal bird that preys on other birds. Instead of cowrie shells, we say groaty buckies. And spoots are what we call razor fish, the little clams that dig into the sand. There's the swat of the sea. That's an old word that you used to hear older folks saying when I was PD. And the swa of the sea is just the general noise of the sea as it's happening. If there's a kind of swale going on that's, and you can hear the sound of the sea for the distance. Not just the crashing of waves on the shore or anything, just the general motion of it. And uh, it can be a very comforting sound unless maybe you had somebody at sea that you were worried about. Well, the one word we would use would be gyo, which is just a, a narrow inlet. Most of the place names have a meaning. Um, most of them would be, could be traced back to the Vikings or the Old Norse. Every rock, every inlet, within every hundred meters of the coast, almost every island right around Orkney and probably the coastline of Scotland would have names that were very significant, mostly from fishing, and that, that's why everybody knew them, because livings came from the sea and uh, that was part and parcel of living on an island was the sea. The trouble is, if you're an Orcadian, if, if you're not going to see, you're not going to use as many as you would like to cane. And if you're not, you know, working with a boat or anything anymore, there's no that kind of knowledge for most of us, as there used to be, because everybody used to go to sea. All they thought for the tune would have a boat or they would go in boats together to catch she silics and caves and all. There's a good old word, caves. <laughs> the fish to catch in the summer and the autumn time. The folklore of Orkney is, is so tied to the sea. You know, I mean, it's, it's such a part of it. Fish were never named. Uh, if you name a fish, then you wouldn't catch it. 
Robert Randall, the poet, remembered as a boy um, going out on a boat and saying, oh, I hope we catch a headache. And the old man fixed them with a glower that would have turned milk sour, you know, sort of turned you to stone. And he said, well, we'll no see when the day knew. Because different sheep belonging to different owners are together on the beach. It's a, a communal thing to gather them up for, um, we we'll call punding for either clipping them or whatever else. It's much easier to do it at high tide when there's less beach um, than at low tide when there'll be a, a great expanse of shore to, for the sheep to get past you. So we're very conscious of when the moon is. It's quite apparent here, you know, the amount of plastic that we've got in the ocean. The mean plastic is one of the greatest dangers. The issue about the plastics. The amount of plastic. I just see lots and lots of plastic. It is really acknowledged what a, what a massive problem plastic is. Plastic pollution is a global problem. Plastic pollution is probably the most important issue that Orkney is facing. I remember on the Orkney Beachcombing website was masses of shotgun, plastic shotgun cartridges um, appearing along a certain stretch of, of beach, beach on the west coast and uh, they came from Newfoundland. And then it's travelling from all over, um, especially when you see like foreign, you know, food packaging for example, you know, that's come from hundreds of miles away. When you're digging in the sand, there's still those tiny bits of plastic rope and all that, you know, and it's like, okay, I've picked up the bits I can see, but if I was just to rake through the sand a bit, there'd be a whole more, you know, load coming up. But then there's an awful lot of um, fishing paraphernalia. There's boys and there's nets, and those nets upset me very much because they're still out in the sea catching fish, you know, ghost nets, and um, it, uh, that, that's just a horrible thought. I mean, a fisherman has a piece of net or, or to throw it over the side, fish come along, eat it. It's the biggest curse that ever was, because it's not being disposed of in the proper way. I think I operate quite a, a conservative fishing operation. I'm very careful about uh, the plastics I use that c covers the bait, and uh, any old creels, etc. I don't just chuck them over the side. Um, Otney Harbours is very good. They have skips for all the, the, the old gear. Uh, the old rope, old creels, and uh, just the, the the packaging that you buy your bait in, and we it's all for recycling, as far as I understand. If I ever see anything floating, uh, if it's any size at all, I usually try to recover it. That unless you take care of the place that you're fishing in, it won't be there for future generations. We invented the plastic. We use the plastic. We dispose of the plastic. So it's entirely within our power to stop that cycle, um, and we have to do it. The big danger now is overfishing, of course. Considerable overfishing. Scallop dredgers. I think they do a lot of damage in the seabed, especially the big dredgers. Uh, they churn up the seabed. And I've seen the machinery, it's just like a rotavator going across the seabed. It just rips along the, the seabed and, and then that's it. Yes, they're making a lot of money, but at what cost? Uh, I know when my father started fishing, if you set a creel and you didn't get two lobsters on it, there was something wrong. That, you know, that's who thick lobsters were. Just nothing like that number of lobsters. We used to use about 70 creels, maybe. And on a good day, you get about 60 or 70 lobsters. On a bad day, you get about 20, one out of three. And uh, then a medium day, you catch about 40. <laughs> you, you need hundreds of creels to catch that many. When it was small boats, working away, lovely. But human greed, they go bigger and bigger and bigger. And now, there's big um, creel boats, fishing for lobes, well, for partings. I think it's, it's sustainable 
at this time, but if you get more in, it's going to be unsustainable. And now we're, we're, we're into a, a kind of wave that's saying, well, we must stop eating meat or cut down eating meat because cattle affect the environment. But so then people are turning to more to fish and, and scooping up. When you see nets coming in, they don't just scoop up the ones you want, they scoop up everything. We also, of course, face bigger challenges which are maybe harder to see, like climate change and the impacts of climate change on the marine environment, um, which are many and varied, some of which maybe are less visible to people. So um, there are changes already happening in distributions of, of different animals, particularly some of the supporting animals within the sea, plankton communities, and that's having knock-on effects on uh, other things that we do see a bit more, maybe like the seabirds. The temperature of the sea is increasing and that will have a general impact on everything that lives in the sea. We might not notice it quite so much here in Orkney because we're in a cold water environment. I'm very sad that the increase in sea temperature is probably to blame for most of the reduction in sand eels and hence bird life. And these are things resulting from circumstances well outside Orkney. It's true of any marine environment. Everything is mobile. Everything is transboundary. Everything is coming into our area of influence. You've got big pressures like climate change and then there's lots of little things that humans, if they add up and add up and are continuing to put more and more pressure on the environment as a whole, how it functions, and on the creatures that are dependent on that, and ultimately, of course, then on humans as well. I think it's a mixed story, so it can look very healthy on the surface, and many things are still very good here, but there are, there are increasing complex challenges. You go out on a day-to-day -day basis and you can still see wonderful things in the ordinary marine environment. People are very engaged with it, but we are seeing losses um, and we need to be working to try and address those and maintain a healthy environment for the decades and centuries to come. I think Orkney's becoming a busier place. Even since I've moved here, we are seeing a lot more applications for fish farms. We're also starting to see structures being brought into Scapa Flow for decommissioning. On top of it's already quite busy fishing activities. So there is a lot going on in Orkney waters, I would say. I would suggest some of the traditional ways might come back in terms of the agenda changing from being, uh, you know, economic driven to being sustainability driven small scale can work well in, in um, you know, small island communities. So thank you, that was just a small snapshot from a, a longer film, but um, it's about in this rather polarised debate that there often can be around marine issues, um, Scottish Wildlife Trust promoting the valuing of the marine environment and encouraging communication and, and understanding, and you saw real evidence of that coming through in that, in that snapshot, um, and it's part of a much bigger project. Um, but it's just a, a very graphic way of, of touching into um, the issues surrounding um, Orkney. So we've had a pretty full on morning. Um, thank you all very much for your attention. Joe left us some challenges about what is the biggest thing that could be done to improve Scotland's wildlife and nature. And we've heard wolves and highly protected marine areas and We've also heard some other stuff around, um, um, and I'm sure you've all got lots of ideas um, as to as to where you think the top priority is. Um, the issue is always the people and making it work, and 
what, therefore, what can this small precious charity do best? How can we best use our, our resources? And the views of the membership on that are extremely welcome. As we close, um, I say that um, we're looking ahead to 2024, the 60th anniversary of the Trust. I'm certainly very privileged to have played the role of chair for the last six years. Thank you to everyone involved in putting um, today's AGM together, to Jo, who couldn't be with us, to Jill especially and her team. Um, we're going to have lunch next, which is upstairs, so we'll be heading up there. But we do have the guided walk. Now, we've had about, I think it was four cancellations so there are a small number of places for anyone who'd like to do you want to come up here and say that pete yeah if anyone would like to go on the guided walk who wasn't booked on um if you can come and see me i'll just wait outside the door um and we can yeah there are four spaces so i think first come first serve <laughs> okay so we're going upstairs for lunch and then when you are there you will be rounded up to go on your bus if you have pre-booked or if you're one of those four people who get who added on that's about 13:45 um so that brings things to an end thank you all very much